So tonight's uh, kind of fun clickbaity title is Did Paul Invent Christianity? And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight is it's going to be really deep into sort of New Testament issues and seeing whether Jesus and Paul are actually preaching the same gospel message. So a little bit about what we do here. Most of you guys probably already know this, but Ratio Christi is a national student org that is dedicated to equipping students and faculty to give historic, uh, philosophical, and scientific reasons for following Jesus Christ and for the truth of his message. Think Theism is our particular chapter's brand, and we host lectures, uh, guest lectures, and we do a podcast. Uh, it's a product of our specific chapter of Ratio Christi, and you can follow us on YouTube or listen to our podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And even though we are a member of Ratio Christi International, the stuff that Think Theism or I say up here is not necessarily endorsed by RC National. Uh, so if I say anything heretical, it's not their fault, it's mine. Uh, but uh, I mean, kind of why we're here is to discuss difficult questions. So we like to kind of get into the nitty gritty of things that might be hard to talk about, but that's why we're here. And just ultimately, our goal is to show that you can have a reasonable faith. You can bring together your faith and your reason. So since tonight is going to be largely about the New Testament, I thought it would be good just to give a quick summary of the basic plot of the New Testament. And there are two major characters here in the New Testament. We have Jesus and we have Paul. So Jesus was a carpenter from the city of Nazareth, which is in modern day uh, Israel or Palestine, the Levant area. And in around 30 AD, he started teaching about the coming kingdom of God. So he taught a lot about morals. Uh, he taught about loving God, loving your neighbor, treating others as you would want to be treated. We know that it's the golden rule. And he taught a lot about caring for the poor and the needy. He ate with sinners and people that society didn't really like. And he taught people to be forgiving and humble and loving. But he wasn't just a moral teacher. Jesus also identified himself with a lot of prophecies from the Old Testament, especially the ones about the Messiah, or in Greek that's called the Christ, and the Son of Man. And on many occasions, Jesus actually claimed to be the Son of God, or even God himself. So as you might imagine, some people didn't particularly like this, especially uh, we're talking like the political elites of the day, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were not fans of Jesus saying these kinds of things, not only because it was against their religion, but it was also politically threatening to them. And if you want to learn more about the historical context of all the stuff that was going on in uh, Israel at the time, that is what we're actually talking about next week. So I would highly recommend that you come to that if you want to learn more. But because of the uh, political elites dislike of Jesus and because of a few other factors, uh, the Roman government in Judea ended up executing him by crucifixion, which is what that picture shows there. But according to the New Testament, on the third day after his death, he rose from the dead and he spent time with his apostles before 40 days later, finally ascending into heaven. And before he ascended, he instructed his apostles to spread his gospel message throughout the entire world. And that's what they start doing. So the apostles found a church or community of believers in Jerusalem. They have a lot of new members and they meet daily to break bread, to pray, to worship, and to care for the poor and needy. But of course, Jerusalem was still a place of great political turmoil about all of this newfangled Jesus stuff that was going on. People didn't like that. And that's where we see Saul of Tarsus come in. So Saul was uh, a Pharisee who was born outside of Judea in Tarsus, which is, uh, we know now that's in Turkey. And uh, he was notorious for persecuting early Christians. So he would go and drag these Christians out of their homes and have them arrested or even put to death. And it was actually because of a lot of this persecution that the church scattered and started spreading to other parts of the world, including the city of Damascus in modern day Syria. And one day, Paul was on his way to Damascus to actually persecute more Christians to get letters so that he could throw them in jail. But while he was on the road, a bright light shone around him. And he fell to the ground, and 
Uh, this picture shows that there was a horse there. There was not actually a horse there, probably. But he sees the risen Jesus come to him. And Jesus says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Jesus commands him to become the apostle to the Gentiles, which was a great change for Paul, who grew up a devout Jew. But of course, Jesus commanded that to him, and he obliged. So he becomes one of the most prolific spreaders of the gospel in history. And he goes all around the world on multiple missionary journeys, uh, sharing Jesus's message. And because he is now the apostle to the Gentiles, he stops going by his Hebrew name, Saul, and starts going by his Greek name, Paul. And during his third journey, he is in Jerusalem for reasons we'll talk about later. And when he's there, he is arrested and he is brought to Rome. And we know from extra biblical sources that he was eventually executed in Rome under the reign of Emperor Nero. So Jesus and Paul are some of the most important characters in the New Testament. And right here you can see some of the basic structure of the actual New Testament. So it's 27 books divided into five different categories. And we're gonna be focusing on those first and third categories. So the first category is known as the Gospels, and those are basically four accounts of Jesus' life, ministry, teachings, and his death and resurrection. And uh, the second one that we're going to be focusing on is Paul's letters. So Paul wrote various letters to churches and to other individuals, and there are 13 of those, and they also make up a great chunk of the New Testament. If we combine the Gospels and Paul's letters, we see that that in terms of the number of verses, makes up about 73% of the New Testament. So about three quarters of the New Testament is Jesus and Paul's teachings, which is, is really cool that we get to read all of those teachings and see what they had to say. But once we actually start looking through them, we see that there's a little bit more tension than we might be comfortable with. So I just want to read you guys a few verses uh, from these different, uh, just a few different verses from Jesus and Paul. So uh, the first one's going to be Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. So Jesus says in his Sermon on the Mount, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So it seems that Jesus is pretty clearly teaching that the law is a very important thing, that people ought to follow them, all of the commandments, and even teach others to follow them. But let's look at what Paul has to say. In his letter to the Romans, in chapter 6, verse 14, he writes, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. He also wrote in Romans chapter 10, verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So it seems like Paul's saying that we're not under the law anymore, that we don't have to follow what it says, which is definitely in contrast to what Jesus seems to be saying. And at first glance, that definitely seems to be a problem. Well, let's look at some other things. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 41 through 46, Jesus says, Then God will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So it seems like what Jesus is saying there is that what we do is very important. Those people who are doing good to others are going to the kingdom of heaven, but the people who aren't are going away into, Jesus says, eternal punishment. Well, now let's look at what Paul says. In Romans chapter 3, verse 28, Paul writes, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And similarly in Ephesians chapter two, verses eight through nine, he says, by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. 
So it seems like Paul is saying that what we do doesn't particularly matter in terms of whether we're getting eternal life. It's not about the good works that we do, the morality that we have, but it's about our faith. That again seems to be in contrast with what Jesus is saying, where you know, the things that we do, the ways that we minister to other people do play a role in our salvation. And also, less in terms of particular verses, but more about just the general topics that they talk about, Jesus seems to focus a lot more on social issues, like caring for the poor and the needy. But Paul doesn't seem to have that same focus. He focuses more on theological issues, like justification or the resurrection. So when someone's first reading through the Bible, this is going to be very confusing, since it seems like they're basically teaching opposite things in a lot of very important areas with the gospel. So what do you guys think about that? Any thoughts? What are some other sources that would contrast that from outside of Matthew? If you have any noted down. Some other sources uh, which well, would contrast? Other gospels, rather. Um, you mean in terms of uh, like other gospels that would contrast what Jesus says in Matthew? No, that would go in line with Matthew, just so that you're looking outside of one book. Um, well, I mean, just the synoptic gospels tend to teach pretty much the same thing. I mean, it is true, Matthew was largely written to, you know, a very specific audience. Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but there are, I mean, I'm pretty sure Luke also has the uh, line about following the law. I'm not certain. Um, but, yeah, I mean, this is just, it seems to be some contrast. Yes, sir? I think it's uh, Jesus', Jesus teachings are broken. In this way, because like uh, concerning faith uh, to the to the robber on the cross, he, he says that we will uh, have dinner together in the heavens, so, and that was basically robber yeah. just was his faith didn't do any, any, any good in this mm -hmm. yes? Yeah. And also the other thing, what was it? The other thing you said, you said that uh, yeah, the poor. I mean, uh, there's a part of the Bible where Jesus, Jesus that tells that you will have always poor, but you should focus on, on my teaching. So. I think it's at those teaching mm -hmm. contradictions. Uh, yeah, so Jesus says some stuff that might contrast the way that we understand some of his other teachings, you know, when we first read them. And that's true. There's a lot more going on than just a few verses that are maybe taken out of context. Yeah, Lucas? Does Jesus not also say multiple times in the New Testament that he saves you and, not, and he doesn't connect it to works? Well, maybe, but it seems like what he's saying here is that it does. We, we do definitely see a little bit of tension between either, you know, the things that Jesus says versus what Paul says, and also, you know, the things that Jesus says, sometimes even with himself. But, you know, really what we want to focus on here is the tension between Jesus and Paul. Like, why is it that while Jesus tends to have a little bit more focus on things like works, Paul doesn't seem to have that focus, yeah? Um, I know that a way that they could be I mean, this might not be where you are right now, but um, a way that the first point could be reconciled is that there are several different types of law that they could be referring to different yeah. yeah. So we'll actually get to that. We might, we're actually going to talk about that a little bit later. There's also a verse in Roman where Paul specifies that. It doesn't say, like he says abolished there. I believe he does use that word there. And elsewhere he says, you are no longer condemned by a lot of things. Mm. And that's a different word. And that's, I think he's trying to say there that while you're still under the law, you're not condemned by your saved. And that's a different, a slightly different idea. Yeah, it is. So that's, again, something that we'll actually get into. We're going to talk a lot more about Paul's view of the law versus the gospel. So to explore some of this tension, we're going to be using uh, these two books. So the first one is called A Beginner's Guide to New Testament Studies by uh, Nijai Gupta. And the second one is called Jesus and Paul Reconnected. It's edited by Todd D. Still, and it's actually a collection of six different essays from New Testament scholars on various issues talking about the tension between Jesus and Paul. We're going to be looking in depth at three of those essays. So this tension is not just something that one notices maybe when they're first looking through the Bible, but it's been noticed by a lot of New Testament scholars, too. So many scholars in the late 19th to early 20th century started having this theory that Jesus' message had actually been corrupted as it was spread, and that this corrupted version is what we have as Christianity today. So it was influenced by things like Hellenism, or Paganism, or Gnosticism, things that were not 
in line with the kind of things that Jesus would have said. And most of them put Paul at the center of this corruption for a few different reasons. For one thing, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles did not have the same kind of Jewish background that Jesus and his audience did. So there may have been a tendency to change what was being preached. Similarly, Paul was born amidst the Jewish diaspora, like we talked about. He wasn't born in Judea. And so he might have had more outside influences, making him more prone to change the message. And because Paul was the early church's most influential theologian, that put him in a unique position to heavily influence and possibly even change the doctrine that Jesus taught. So here's a couple of quotes from scholars on the issue. So uh, James Tabor in Paul and Jesus writes, to defend the idea that Paul taught the exact same thing as Jesus requires one to ignore, downplay, or deny altogether the sharp tensions and the radically irreconcilable differences reflected within our New Testament documents, particularly in Paul's own letters. To put it a lot more concisely, William Reed said that Paul was the, quote, second founder of Christianity. So since then, many of the assumptions behind this viewpoint have actually been debunked. So for one, they claimed that because Paul grew up in the diaspora outside of Judea, he was influenced by paganism and Hellenism, especially to an extent that maybe people who were born in Judea would not have been. But Palestine was not free of Greek influence. There's no reason to assume that Paul was any more influenced by any kind of outside influence than anyone else would have been. Paul, uh, one of the authors said that basically, there's no reason to assume that Paul would have been any, more, any less Jewish than someone living in Judea, right? Paul, wouldn't, Paul was still growing up in this Jewish community. And so they would have had probably the same amount of influence. And Paul's theology still very clearly highlights his Jewish heritage. He always spoke of, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He never co-opted Greek gods or any pagan practices. He wasn't uh, a syncretist is the word. But even though a lot of the assumptions behind that hypothesis had been debunked, there, there clearly is still some tension between their teachings. That tension still exists. And it's especially prevalent in the way that a lot of people perceive of Christianity in the modern era. So Anthony Thistleton in The Living Paul writes, very many people, perhaps even millions, view Jesus of Nazareth with admiration and respect but they see Paul as the founder of a different system of doctrine and the inventor of established churches. So he says that basically Jesus, and a lot of people see it, that Jesus was this nice, kind, loving, maybe like a kind of hippie sort of dude who loved everyone and taught something very different than Paul was with his you know, religion and churches and all of this other theological stuff. This has led to things like the Red Letter Movement, which is a movement that says that we should focus either more on or solely on the teachings of Jesus, which are, you know, in the Bible, the red letters, and less on the writings of other biblical authors who weren't Jesus, and especially Paul. So when we're looking through uh, these different verses and trying to harmonize them, we're going to have, you know, as Christians, a little bit of a different uh, approach than a skeptic might have. And this is because most of us as, as Christians have some concept of biblical inspiration or biblical inerrancy, which in general is just the idea that the Bible is true in everything that it teaches. So this right here is the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. It's one that's held to by a lot of evangelical Christians. And uh, it says, quote, scripture is without error or fault in all its teaching. So when a Christian is approaching two different Bible verses that seem like they might contradict each other, they know that if they actually contradict each other, then they can't both be true. But they have to both be true. So you, there has to be some way that what these two verses are saying are, is actually in line with each other. So when two different passages seem to say two different things, we have a tendency to harmonize the two passages. And that's a lot of what I think we were doing earlier on. Uh, for example, when we talked about the different kinds of law, like that's a way to harmonize the differences between Jesus and Paul. But a skeptic is not going to have this approach because a skeptic is going to at first approach the Bible as a purely human text, the same way they'd approach probably most other texts. So if two passages seem to teach different things and there's not some sort of obvious way that they're connected, 
then they probably do teach different things in their eyes. So because of this, they're not going to focus maybe on what the Bible says as a whole, but focus on the individual authors and what they're teaching, like Luke versus Paul or Matthew or James. They're going to look at the different historical and textual traditions that they're coming from, like the Jesus tradition is a term that you see come up a lot. So tonight I want to try to maybe avoid the tendency to harmonize things and uh, come up with reasons why they can go together really well and just try to look at the passages for what they are and see where we can find congruity. What do you guys think? Any questions? I think that makes sense, but it also puts into question of like, am I not putting these uh, verses into context then? Am I um, not giving them the credit that they do deserve? Because these are, um, like they do have a specific, like it's in the same sense of like, you're not, uh, they have their, um, what's the word? Uh, so it's a, Exposition. Uh, exegesis. exegesis. Thank you. Um, they each have their own exegesis, just as, as literature does. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to take that into account, um, even, even if we aren't trying to uh, just take, uh, like, even if we aren't trying to force them together. Yeah. We definitely do need to take into account the context. And I like that you talked about, you said exegesis? exegesis or exegesis? Okay. Well, because, uh, you know, definitely one of the things that we want to avoid is. Uh, eisegesis. If you guys are familiar with the terms exegesis and eisegesis, the sort of two different approaches to understanding what the Bible has to say. With eisegesis, you are reading meaning into a text. And with exegesis, you're trying to pull meaning out of a text. So it's not that harmony is inherently a bad thing to look for. But the problem is when you're trying to put meaning into a text, that makes it harmonious. Our goal is going to try and be to take meaning out of the text to see whether or not they're actually aligned. So we're going to try to go for an exegetical harmony. So to look at Jesus and Paul, I'd like to talk about three different issues. And these are in line with three of the essays in uh, Jesus and Paul Reconnected. We're going to look at what Jesus says about them, what Paul says about them, and we're going to look to see if they're actually teaching the same thing, where they're the same and where they might differ. So our three issues are going to be the role of grace in the gospel, the uh, importance of the law versus the gospel, whether it still applies, things of that nature. And lastly, uh, concern for the poor and how central of a role that plays in the gospel. So first, we're going to talk about the role of grace. So Jesus and Paul both have a lot to say on this issue, and that's arguably one of the most important things in the gospel. You know, Paul says that it's by grace that we have been saved. So this is very central. So first, what does Jesus have to say? Well, as most of you guys who have read the New Testament know, a lot of times when Jesus is teaching, he does so in parables, which are just an allegory that are meant to teach a topic. Sometimes they're actually meant to be intentionally opaque, but the prodigal son right here is uh, not too bad. So yeah, one of his most notable parables is this one, the prodigal son. And uh, to give you a quick summary of what happens in this one, in this story, a boy asks his father to give him his share of the inheritance, even before the father has died, which is extremely rude because it's essentially the boy saying, hey, I don't care about you. I wish you were dead. I just want your money. But the father obliges. He gives the son his inheritance, and the, the younger son runs away and spends it all on partying and whatever else a young man might spend his money on, but he was not living a good life. And eventually he runs out of money. He, has, he ends up having to go find work and he works in a pig pen. And at this point he is so destitute and hungry that he is just wishing that he could eat the slop that the pigs are eating. But he comes up with an idea. He says, you know, why am I staying here? My father has so many servants. I, can't go up, I can't be his son anymore. I've already taken half of his money, but I can go back to my father's house and just ask if I can be a hired servant. At least that way I'd have some food in my stomach. So he walks back to his hometown and sees his father and his father actually sees him coming down the road, runs up and hugs him. The son asks if he can be a hired worker, but the father says that there's no way that he can do that because he is his son. They, the father ends up throwing him a big party, inviting a lot of people, and it's just kind of a happy ending for him. But this son, the prodigal son, has an elder brother, 
And it's not a happy ending for the elder brother because this brother is very mad at his father. Uh, I mean, what, this younger brother has just run away and you know, run away from home and spent a bunch of money. But then when he comes back, the father throws him a massive party. And he goes, you've never thrown me a massive party. You've never given me a goat to share with my friends. And the father understands his anger, but actually rebukes the older brother for uh, you know, acting this way. So what can we learn about Jesus's doctrine of grace from this passage? So it's easy to see some of the basic parallels to grace, right? We gravely misuse what God has given us, but God always welcomes us back with open arms, just like the father did. But our focus is actually going to be less on the younger brother and more on the elder brother. So the younger brother had taken half of the family's money, and the fact that he was staying part of the family meant that he was actually eating into the older brother's portion of the inheritance. So the older brother was understandably angry at this situation. And the father understands what the, younger brother, or what the older brother is feeling, but he says that it was necessary that he welcome back the prodigal son. So the elder brother now faces a choice. He can either welcome back this younger brother who had caused irreparable damage to their family, or he can alienate his brother, but in doing so, also alienate his father because his father had accepted this younger son. So if we look a little bit more at the context of what's going on uh, in that chapter, earlier in the chapter, the Pharisees, those political elites that we had talked about earlier, they were very you know, devout Jews, they were upset at Jesus because Jesus was eating with tax collectors and sinners. And uh, they did not like these people. These were kind of the outcasts or the pariahs of society. No one liked these guys. And so in context, we can see it's a little bit more clear. The elder brother is representing those Pharisees and scribes, while the prodigal son is representing these people that Jesus was eating with. So then Jesus seems to be teaching that God's grace is more than just being forgiving towards the people who repent and come back to him, but it's actually a challenge. It requires the people who are more established or the, the insiders to accept the people who are the outsiders or at risk of uh, sounding a little social justice-y, the bit more marginalized. So now that we've talked about Jesus, let's look at Paul for a little bit. So Paul's doctrine of grace can be seen all throughout his letters. Um, and we're going to look at two passages in particular. We're going to look at Galatians chapter 1 and Romans chapter 9, verses 11, or chapters 9 through 11. So starting with Galatians 1, Paul is writing to the church in Galatia. And uh, this, narr or this uh, passage is basically an autobiography of Paul, a short one, but it's a good one. And it's divided into two parts. So the first part is about his life under the law, and the second part is about his life under grace. So Paul was born and raised a Jew, and Paul considered himself very zealous, a very devout Jew, especially holding up to what he called the traditions of his fathers. So he thought that he was very solidly you know, an insider in the covenant, all that stuff. But when Jesus appeared to Paul on that road to Damascus, this was a life-changing moment for Paul, and he realized that in attempting to uphold God's will by persecuting this church, who he saw as blasphemers and against God, in attempting to uphold God's will, he was actually going against it. So let's also look at Romans chapter 9 through 11. So in this uh, passage, Paul is sort of talking about the relationship between Israel and the Gentiles. And he makes a three-part argument talking about the shifting identity of Israel. So first of all, he establishes the privileges that Israel has, you know, having been God's people for generations, but he questions the boundaries of who Israel actually is. It was generally understood that it was pretty much an ethnic heritage. It was, you know, the descendants of Abraham. But Paul questions that it might actually include people who are outside of that ethnic heritage. And it also might not include all of the people who actually are a part of that heritage. So he's shaking up the boundaries a bit. Then in the second part, Paul speaks of this, uh, he calls it a stone of stumbling set out by God. 
He says that Israel hasn't attained to God's promises, but many of the Gentiles have because of this stone of stumbling. And he makes clear that this stone is actually Jesus with his death and resurrection. And finally, Paul says that Israel has only become a remnant of what it once was, and that the Gentiles have been added. He uses an analogy of a tree, where one branch has been cut off of the tree, and another branch, the branch of the Gentiles, has been grafted on. So now that we've looked a little bit about what they're saying, are they actually teaching the same doctrine of grace? Well, they use very different language. This is pretty obvious from the outset. They're not talking about it necessarily in the same way. And Paul isn't directly using Jesus' teaching. He's not quoting Jesus or using the parables or anything like that. But at the same time, we can see that they're actually teaching the same paradigm of grace. So and on a few different points. For one thing, God was working through these sort of outsider groups to bring about his kingdom. For Jesus, this was the tax collectors and sinners. For Paul in Galatians, this was the church. And for, in Romans, it's the Gentiles. And the groups that had considered themselves insiders, so those would be like the Pharisees or Paul himself or Israel, the Jews, had to accept these people or risk being alienated from God's covenant and grace altogether. So the grace that they teach is both freeing to, toward those who are sort of outsiders or prodigal, as it were, and also challenging toward the insiders who sort of consider themselves already established in righteousness and justice in the covenant. And so this idea of grace is something that comes from the Jewish tradition. It wasn't this entirely new thing that they're coming up with, and that's a common misconception. But at the same time, it cuts against the way that this grace was commonly understood in the same way. So overall, you know, these are both kind of cutting against Jewish tradition in the same way. So they really are teaching the same concept of grace. What do you all think? Anything? All right. So now let's move on to the second issue. So this is going to be the law versus the gospel. This is one of those kind of issues that we hit on with those verses earlier. It seemed like they were teaching very different things about the law and the gospel with Jesus teaching that we're still under the law and Paul teaching that we're sort of beyond it at this point. So to see Jesus's perspective on the law, we're going to look at the story of the rich young ruler. So this happens in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 30. It also occurs, I think, in both Mark and Luke. So in this narrative, a rich young man comes up to Jesus and asks him what he has to do to inherit eternal life. And first, Jesus responds that the young man must keep the commandments. Don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery, etc. And the young man responds that he already keeps the commandments, which is great. And Jesus says, go sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And the young man, upon hearing Jesus say this, because he was you know, a very rich man, he had a lot of possessions, he didn't want to sell them, and he walks away sorrowfully from Jesus. This is where we get the famous quote of Jesus saying, truly I say to you, it's more difficult for a rich man to get into heaven than for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle pass through the eye of a needle, but with God, all things are possible. That, that's what this picture was an attempt of, but uh, yeah, yeah, it was a camel next to a sewing needle, but I don't think uh, Dolly, or I don't think the, we used mid journey. I don't think it was very good at uh, drawing organic pictures. This was the best and least terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway. To go back to what uh, Jesus was talking about, the order of Jesus's responses is actually very telling here. So he first tells the young man that he has to obey the law. Now, this young man was Jewish. He'd probably grown up Jewish. And if you'd grown up Jewish, you knew that the way to inherit eternal life was to follow the law, was to follow God's commandments. Um, so that was no surprise to him. And he said, yeah, I already do follow all of this. And uh, this was not, you know, too far off of what Jesus typically commanded. Uh, Jesus consistently supported 
upholding the law, like we saw in that verse a few slides ago. But at the same time, there's a little bit of mixed messaging because Jesus also sometimes seems to cut against the law. He has his disciples pick up grain on the Sabbath. He doesn't really care too much about the ritual hand washing and things like that. And uh, he actually condemns the Pharisees for pressing people too hard on what he calls the weightier matters of the law, things like tithing and not focusing enough on the, uh, you know, things like the morality, the loving, one, loving God and loving one's neighbor. So that's a little bit of an interesting thing that Jesus does. So after the rich man says that he already does all of you know, those things, he follows the law. Jesus adds that the ruler has to sell all that he has and give it to the poor and follow Jesus. So our first instinct might be to think, oh, well, this is an additional requirement. This is something else that Jesus is asking us to do. Not only is this man having to follow the law, but he's having to sell all that he has and give it to the poor. But that actually doesn't really make sense in terms of this order because, uh, you know, why would Jesus leave out this major additional part of the requirements to inherit eternal life from what he said at first until after this person said he already followed the law? I mean, this young man would have already known that he needed to follow the law to get eternal life. So why did Jesus leave that out until later? This, the implication here is that this isn't actually an additional requirement to the law because separating them wouldn't make sense in that context. Somehow, this second requirement is part and parcel of that first requirement. So there are a couple of different ways to look at this. So one option is that Jesus is teaching that selling all that the rich man has and giving it to the poor is the way to truly uphold the law because the law revolves around loving God and loving one's neighbor. Uh, if Jesus is God, then giving up everything to fully follow him would be what the law commands. The other way we might look at it is that the requirements for the law have changed in light of Jesus uh, coming to earth and dying on the cross and all of that. Uh, that somehow we, uh, the, the requirements for obedience to the law are different in light of the gospel. So we've seen what Jesus has talked about, so now let's look at Paul. So Paul's view of the law is best seen in his letter to the Galatian church. And that's because in the context of the Galatian church, uh, there had been people coming up to this church and instructing its members that if they wanted to be saved, they had to follow the Mosaic law. And that's sort of represented by the idea of circumcision. They had to be circumcised, things like that. And Paul argues that this is contrary to the gospel. And he actually says that if anyone is preaching to you a gospel that's contrary to what I am teaching you, let them be anathema, let them be accursed. So Paul's very strongly against this uh, requirement that these people are saying to have to follow the law. Paul speaks of the law as a curse very commonly. And he talks about the people who are under the law as slaves. He also seems to say in Galatians that the law was a temporary measure and that with Christ's death came the law's fulfillment. And he says that those who are in Christ are no longer under the law. So it seems like Paul's pretty antinomian, pretty anti-law. But at the same time, we see a little bit of mixed messaging from Paul too. Because Paul in Romans chapter 7, verse 12, says that even though you know, he sees the law as a curse, he says that the law's demands are holy and righteous and good. So how can that be? How can the law be a bad thing, but all of its demands be good things? He seems to argue that the law is a curse to us because we can't fully follow the law. And that the law has no power to bring life to the dead. It has no salvific power. So even though the law has some good characteristics and the things that the law tells us to do are good, the law is still a curse to us because we can't fully follow it. So are Jesus and Paul teaching the same thing? Well, they definitely do share some common views of the law, right? So the, they both share this view that the law's demands are good. Jesus definitely seems to support that. And Paul says that in Romans. And they say that it's, they would both agree that it's a statement of God's will for his people. 
They would also agree that the law doesn't have any power to save people, that only the gospel has that power. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have needed to come, and Paul very clearly seems to take that view. But at the same time, there does definitely seem to be some differences in what they're teaching, right? Jesus never speaks of the law as a curse in the way that Paul does. Je or, sorry, yeah, and then Jesus also never speaks of redemption from the law. Uh, Jesus generally sees the law as, in general, good, where Paul kind of seems to see it as, in general, a bad thing that we need saving from. So it seems like a pretty sharp difference here between what they're teaching. But one way that we might think to uh, resolve this tension is, like uh, I think Rowan said it earlier, is that we might uh, think to divide the law into two separate parts. We might have the moral law and the ceremonial law is the common parlance for it. And I mean, here's why we might think to do that. For one thing, Jesus says that the law revolves around loving God with all one's heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving one's neighbor as himself, and doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. I mean, Jesus says that on these things hang the law and the prophets. And it seems like also what Paul is generally rebuking about the law is the people who are forcing uh, the churches to adhere to the ritual demands of the law, things like circumcision. But he still praises things like the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And he says that against these things, there is no law, that the law is actually good in supporting these virtues. So there's a bit of a division between the weightier matters of the law and the less weighty matters of the law. And the weightier matters seem to be more of the moral things, whereas the less weighty matters are things like tithing. And Paul seems to have a division there too. So if we actually look at the law through that paradigm and look at their teachings through that paradigm of moral versus ceremonial law, their teachings actually become a lot more uh, cohesive in terms of you know, what they actually practically mean for us. You know, following the ceremonial law, it seems they would both say is less important for us than following the moral law. So what do you guys think about this? This one's definitely a lot more of a tricky one. This is probably our hardest one of all of them. Yeah. I have a question, actually. Mm -hmm. Just something I don't decide, something I just don't know the answer to. I'm not sure you do either. When Paul refers to the law, is he exclusively referring to like the law written in the Bible, or is he also referring to the additions made by the Jewish government? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I, would, I think that generally speaking, when Paul refers to the law, he's kind of referring, yeah, it's a hard one. I think he's kind of referring to, I mean, A, the Torah, you know, the first five books of the Old Testament. Those are, colloquial, those are colloquially just called the law. That's why they divide the Old Testament into the law and the prophets. Um, but I mean, yeah, it could be sometimes that he's talking about the additions. It could be that he uses the term in multiple different ways. Um, I think, generally speaking, what he's talking about, though, is the law as opposed to the gospel. That is to say, it's the, uh, the law was basically that covenant made with Moses um, on Sinai, as opposed to the uh, gospel that Jesus preached, you know, that God sent his son and things like that. And we actually kind of see that in Galatians chapter 3, um, where... Yeah, the law was more just sort of, like we said earlier, more of a temporary measure. So it's sort of more the covenant that God had with Moses more than maybe the additional laws that were made by people. And you can see that in Matthew 5 when he says, I didn't come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. And that Jesus was saying, like, hey, this is what I'm doing. And then Paul was showing the church, like, how they could live that out. Mm -hmm. Of, like, Jesus said he fulfilled it, so you don't have a sacrifice anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was the sacrifice. Right. We have things like that. There's a lot of interesting uh, fulfillment ideas in the New Testament, like uh, baptism fulfilling circumcision, etc. Um, and yes. uh, do you think, and I don't think you really said this, but in the rich young ruler interchange with Jesus and the rich young ruler, it seems like you could say, even a skeptic could might understand Jesus as, trying to uh, 
have the rich young Mueller acknowledge that he couldn't keep the law. Mm -hmm. you, know, you say you're, you've kept the whole law, but you know, do, do what it says. Mm -hmm. you know, sell, your, sell your possessions and yeah. follow me. And he's going, oh, well, I guess I really haven't. I really can't keep the law. And I think that's a good way to look at it, too, because that's when the rich young ruler leaves. Jesus says, well, I'm telling you, it's harder for a camel to get through the eye of an, or it's harder for a rich person to get in heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And then the disciples say, well, then how can anyone be saved? And he says, well, with God, all things are possible. So that definitely could hint more towards Jesus using that to show us the need for grace over yeah. the need for the law. But yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's very, just... I, I don't know, that's a very Lutheran way of slicing up all... The law and gospel? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't really see law and gospel divisions, like, in the, in the New Testament. No, I mean, what do you think? I, th I, think, I think you're just... I think you're importing, doing a little... What was the word you used? Isogesis? Isometrical, I, I, I isosceles. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you're reading the Bible through the lens of Luther. Luther did that, slicing up stuff. Like, I don't, you know, I don't read in the Torah anything about moral and ceremonial law. It's like, it's all just law, law. Yeah. Well, and the guy who made, um, the guy who wrote this essay that I'm going off of, he actually did very clearly say, he's like, just so we're clear, this division between moral and ceremonial is not explicitly made anywhere in the Bible, anywhere in the New Testament. But what he's saying is that it's more of just a paradigm that we can use to look at it to see that they're actually showing the same thing, as opposed to a division that they make that we're supposed to, you know, some sort of fundamental division there. Um, where if we divide it into the moral and ceremonial law, then it helps us understand, okay, yeah, this is, uh, this is what we really need to be focusing on, is loving God, loving our neighbor. And I think Jesus and Paul would both agree on that. All right, well... Our last one that we're going to talk about is concern for the poor in both Jesus and Paul. And like we said earlier, this is going to be less focused on specific verses, but it's going to be more focused on just the general content of the things that they're teaching. So it's kind of hard to overstate Jesus' concern for the poor. We see that all the time throughout the Gospels. So just to give a few examples, Jesus tells multiple people to sell all of their possessions or a lot of their possessions and give it to the poor. He tells that to the rich young ruler we just talked about. He also tells that to Zacchaeus, the short tax collector who climbed the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And uh, Jesus tells him, sell a lot of your possessions, give it to the poor. He obliges, and Jesus says, truly salvation has come to this house this day. Additionally, many of Jesus' parables have the poor sort of as the good guys of the parable, and the rich people are the bad guys. A uh, prominent example is the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16, where Lazarus was a poor beggar who uh, sat at this rich man's gate, but the rich man never helped him. Eventually, the rich man goes off to torment after he dies, and Lazarus goes to paradise, or they call it Abraham's bosom. Even though that's not necessarily the point of the parable, we still see, uh, you know, sort of Jesus showing that message. He also, in the Lord's Prayer, says, give us this day our daily bread. And uh, the author of this essay points out that, it, in, at least in the Luke version, this very clearly refers to, like, physical sustenance, you know. Help for us not to be hungry, but nourish us more than in just a spiritual way. Uh, one last thing that the author of this essay focuses on is this specific passage in Luke chapter 7, where John the Baptist, the man who baptized Jesus, has been imprisoned by Herod, and he sends messengers over to Jesus to ask if he actually is the Messiah or the Christ, uh, or if they should wait for someone else. And Jesus, quoting a prophecy from Isaiah about who the Messiah would be, says that, um, well, just look around and see what you see. The blind can see, the deaf can hear, the lame can walk, lepers are cleansed. And he ends it with, and the poor have the good news preached to them. So somehow amidst all of these miracles, the poor having the gospel preached to them is at the summit. It's at the very end of this. It's the climax. The poor have the gospel preached to them. So this just shows how central to Jesus concern for the poor was to his message. So now let's look at Paul. If you're reading through Paul, you're going to notice a lot more sort of theological language about faith and justification and salvation and the resurrection and a little bit less about 
these social issues, like we talked about earlier. And concern for the poor just doesn't feature as explicitly in Paul's letters as it does in the Gospels. But the context seems to tell a different story. So for one thing, it's clear from 2 Thessalonians and from 1 Timothy that these churches that Paul founded actually maintained treasuries out of which they would give to the poor. And uh, Paul in 2 Thessalonians rebukes people who are abusing the funds in the treasury or who are just being lazy and taking things out of it. That's where he says, he who doesn't work won't eat. Um, additionally, in Acts chapter 20, Paul exhorts the elders in Ephesus to support the weak. And contextually, this refers to the actual economically disadvantaged, not just people who are spiritually weak. And so supporting the weak played a key role in Paul's message here about God's grace. Paul also, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, rebukes the Corinthian church for having some of its members uh, eat and take the Lord's Supper before the poor have a seat at the table. And so in this passage, he juxtaposes Jesus' selfless sacrifice you know, in the Lord's Supper versus their selfishness against the poor. And he actually says here that because of their a lack of concern for the poor, or at least for their taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, however you want to look at that. But the things that they were doing were actually leading pe to people getting sick and dying physically. So it's clear that this was a central issue for Paul too. And the last thing I want to focus specifically on is the collection for the saints in Jerusalem. So in around 53 to 57 AD, there was a famine in Jerusalem. And so people were starving and churches around the world were collecting funds to help the people who were struggling there, especially to help the Christians who were struggling there. And Paul was sort of a ringleader in this fundraising effort. So he was really concerned about this collection and he went around collecting these funds and repeatedly praised the churches that were giving to this collection. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he praises the Macedonian church who actually gave above and beyond what they were uh, comfortably able to give, even to their own poverty. And Paul personally delivers these funds to Jerusalem. Now, like we talked about earlier, Jerusalem, because of just, it was the center of Judaism, people were very strongly against Christianity there. So even though there was a church there, a lot of the political rulers in the area and the other people were strongly against Christianity. So it was an extremely risky place for Paul to go. And he was keenly aware of the dangers that were there. In Romans chapter 15, he asks the Roman church to pray for him and, you know, that he may be safe. And in Acts chapter 20 and 21, uh, people are begging him not to go, but he still does. And in Acts chapter 21, this is why he's arrested in Rome. I mean, not because he was delivering the funds, but it's when he's going to deliver these funds that he ends up being, sorry, arrested in Jerusalem, taken off to Rome and eventually executed. So are they teaching the same thing about care for the poor? Even though Paul's letters don't make as much of an explicit mention of the poor as Jesus's teachings, we can be pretty confident that Paul definitely cared about the poor from the context of these different letters and from the life that he lived. And we know that the Christian communities that Paul founded uh, did the same. Paul's concern for the poor was strong enough that aware of the grave danger he faced in Jerusalem, he still went to personally deliver those funds to go help the poor. And that's where he was arrested. Jesus, throughout his ministry, taught a sacrificial or a selfless care for the poor. And Paul exhibited just that in his life and in his teachings. So what do you all think? All right. So what should we take away from tonight? Well, if we look at Jesus and Paul's teachings, we can see that there's definitely some tension between them, at least at first glance. So, and because of this tension, Paul, uh, scholars have theorized that Paul corrupted Jesus's message and that this corruption is what we know as Christianity today. And the tension between Jesus and Paul's teachings, even though a lot of those assumptions had been debunked, it still greatly affects people's perception of modern Christianity.
So we looked at a few issues, and we've seen that even though there are some differences, Jesus and Paul still are fundamentally teaching the same gospel message. For one thing, that grace is both freeing to outsiders and challenging to insiders. That the law is an expression of God's will, but has no salvific power, and that the ritual demands of the law shouldn't overshadow the gospel or possibly the moral demands of the law. And that concern for the poor is central to the gospel message. So I think definitely one thing to think about is when we are looking at those passages, there's a strong tendency to look at them and try to come up with the quickest explanation that we can to uh, figure out how they actually don't contradict each other. But sometimes it's actually really helpful just to sit with the discomfort for a little bit and to look at you know, these two passages just on their own and what they seem to be saying. And sometimes when we're sitting with that, we can actually get a deeper understanding of how these two different teachings are actually congruous. Thank you all.